So yeah, this workshop uh, will be about color in the image making context. We know that color is an integral part of the visual experience of humans and through it we receive uh, tons of information about light, materials and textures. This is what we call the three pillars of the image and the idea is that uh, if we start seeing the image and reading the image and understanding the image as a, as a sum of these three channels, color, value and composition, then we have full control over um, the message we, we try to send and, uh, and, and the mood and the focal elements and basically we can um, drive the viewer's attention to where it needs to be. And in, in, the context, in our context of uh, image making, color has the power to either make or break a scene. When used correctly, it, it can help us convey the intended mood and guide the viewer to what's important and when used wrongly, it can really destroy continuity and impair realism. All right, so uh, before we dive into the specifics of the um, uh, image making context of color, I have uh, included here a brief chapter on uh, the color physics and the, the way the human eye perceives uh, color and light. The first one is that light is a form of energy, and the second one is that light energy travels in waves. Uh, this is probably a familiar uh, scheme to all of you, the visible part of electromagnetic spectrum. So some type of light travels in short waves and some other light travels in long waves. And we can see here that the red uh, side of the color spectrum travels in long wavelengths and the blue and violet in short wavelengths. And actually uh, having shorter uh, wavelength means more energy and thus higher uh, frequency. So we know that light travels strictly on a straight line, that is unless something gets in the way and it interrupts this, uh, this beam of light. That something will do one of the following. It will either reflect light, as it happens with a mirror, it will refract the light, which means uh, bend it, as with a prism or lens, or it will scatter it, as with uh, molecules of gases in the atmosphere. So, in a way, we can say that light is the source of all colors. It uh, carries the entire spectrum of color. And then the question arises, why do certain objects appear to have a certain qu uh, color? Why does the, the apple appear to be red, when we know that light carries the entire spectrum of color? So the answer to this is that when light hits an object, the object's surface will selectively absorb some part of the light wave and it will reflect the rest. So in a way, whenever we see the color red on the surface of the apple, it is because the surface of the apple will absorb the entire spectrum of light except for the red wavelength. This will be reflected back to us and arrive to our eyes. And I mentioned our eyes here, and that brings us actually to the second important topic of the subject which is the human eye and the way uh, it, um, it processes this visual information from the exterior world. So yeah, without going into great, great detail, let's say that uh, light, after passing through the pupil and the lens, it hits the retina, which is this membrane at the back of our eyeball. And uh, the retina is made of photoreceptor cells. These are the cones, and the rods. So we have two, uh, actually it's three, but two main types of photoreceptor cells. And rods are sensitive to light intensity, while cones are sensitive to light wavelength, which, as we've seen before, corresponds to color. So in a way, these two photoreceptor cells have this, this capacity to, to detect wa wavelengths, light wavelengths, and this, through this information, these uh, signals, will travel through the optic nerve to our brain and then it will be processed further and uh, read as the corresponding color. So in a way we can say that whatever we perceive is, the, w is the, the translation our brain gives to certain light wavelengths. Yeah, perhaps we should mention here that um, um, cones, which are the photoreceptor cells as, as we've discussed, uh, are sen sensitive to one of three colors. It's either red, green, on, or blue. And this is actually the famous RGB system that we use uh, all the time in uh, digital uh, image making. 
So, in a way, we can say that knowing how light functions in the real world can sort of upgrade our way of building an image. If we try to look at the scene as a sum of light rays bouncing around different objects, um, then we can get a better sense of value and color. Um, so, in a way, trying to visualize in our head the journey light takes in our scene uh, will help us create more realistic and natural looking scenes. Say that uh, whenever we hit render in our render engine, this is basically what happens behind the scene. It's, it's our camera emitting uh, light rays, and these light rays bounce around different objects. They reflect, they refract, on, or scatter, as we, we've seen and then they get back to our camera. And this, uh, this um, light, uh, light ray will again be processed and reflected upon the, the final image. It's, I think it's, uh, it's a great uh, practice for us in, in our domain to, to study the real world, understand how light and color functions, and then try to bring out some of these ideas in our um, everyday work. We can summarize the importance of color into three pillars. Color can, uh, can work in, as a compositional element, it can uh, work as mood controller in the scene, and it can also enhance the naturalism of our, of our image. And uh, we can see that uh, in composition we can um, uh, talk about uh, the color uh, contrast and the color hierarchy in the scene and how to, to use these things to create focal elements. Uh, the mood brings us to color psychology with, and the different um, uh, correlations and uh, signals that different colors send to viewers. And uh, naturalism is about the way hue, saturation and brightness combine together depending on the light conditions that we have in our scene. So we will later see, for example, that hue, saturation and brightness are strictly connected together and we cannot uh, control one of them without touching the, the other two channels. So we will go through each one of these pillars uh, in detail. Starting with the composition, which is about contrast and hierarchy, and then clean shapes. And I will go through these two topics in detail. We can start with contrast and hierarchy. Yeah, as we've already seen in our uh, previous chapter about composition, composition is uh, about uh, establishing a focal element so that the viewer's eyes are casually and automatically drawn to what's important in the scene. And like this, we avoid confusion and uh, information overload. Remember that we always strive for simplicity and uh, clear messages in our images. We don't want the viewer to wander around the image without any purpose. We, we want them to automatically and directly focus on what's important. And then, as a bonus, uh, as a side dish, let's say, we can start, uh, or the viewer can start exploring uh, the scene and discovering all the nice details and textures and the information that we've um, installed there. Yeah, so again, to use color as a compositional element, we need to think about contrast. Uh, the same applies to value and saturation. Actually, let me, um, let me emphasize this one more time, that uh, uh, contrast is our biggest and most important tool whenever we try to, to compose a scene. We always need, to want actually, to, to create contrast between elements. If, if I want to make something appear bright, then I probably need to place something dark next to it. And this will make the bright element pop up immediately. So, having said that, we will now try to focus these ideas on color. This is a, actually a, a great example, a classic example, we may say, where color alone establishes the necessary contrast to read the focal elements in the scene. And we, this will become evident if we analyze the image in the three uh, channels of information. The first one from the uh, left-hand side is the values, then we have the saturation channel, and finally we have the color channel. So let's have a look at that for a moment. If we study the value and saturation channel, we can see that there is not no strong contrast between the main character of our scene, which is this uh, mechanic uh, organism or robot or whatever. Um, so yeah, th this is our main character. 
But notice that it doesn't show a big contrast between itself and the surroundings. For example, the, the sky and the ground have a very similar tone, value tone, with, uh, with our character. The same applies to saturation. Again, the saturation channel feels more or less uniform. There are no strong contrasts here. And then if we go to the color channel, this is where the magic happens. We have a very high contrast between the characters, the main characters, and the surroundings. Everything in the image has a bluish tone, and then suddenly we have a strong golden yellow in our uh, focal elements. Of course, let me, let me say here that th this color choice of yellow against blue is not accidental, of course. This uh, gets us back to the uh, color harmony theory, which basically studies the different relationships between colors and how we can pick the right colors in uh, the right combinations. But in the purpose of this uh, workshop, we will not focus on that. I will only briefly here and there try to make some uh, remarks. But for now, let's only say that the yellow and the blue are in very high contrast with each other. They are actually complementary colors in the color wheel. And for that reason, they present the maximum possible contrast between colors. And th this is why the creator here uh, went for this color harmony. So yeah, uh, to, to sum it up, our example here shows that just by using color contrast, we can create a clean and easy to read composition where the hierarchy of elements is clear and evident. Make it a habit to always check the relationship between objects, always check the contrast between the elements, um, and don't, don't worry too much about their absolute uh, values. Uh, and as a technical tip, uh, we can uh, make use of this um, uh, channel abstractions in, uh, in Photoshop, actually. It's super easy to isolate the values, isolate the saturation and the color into our file. So uh, we should actually make it a habit to constantly check these three channels of information while we are working on an image in order to always be on top of things and control the, the general um, uh, composition. Uh, so the second part, compositional aspect of color is clean shapes. The high level idea here is that we shouldn't treat color only as an attribute of objects, but also as an object, object in and of itself. Um, and it, in the sense that it creates shapes and forms. So color creates shapes and forms. It sounds a bit weird at first, but let us go through some examples. Start with this one. And this is actually a great example that exactly uh, showcases what I just said. And if we try to abstract the image a bit, we can start seeing that the image is composed of two main shapes. We have this yellow and orange shape, which is the building and the ground. And we have this blue shape, which is the, the sky. And the idea is that here, the creator made a, a very strong and clear separation between these two areas in order to enhance readability. And, and notice also how uniformly almost uh, colored these two areas are. And somehow the two are balanced together. So uh, we, we can imagine that the first step in the, in the actual process of painting this image was exactly this one where we just see two color, uniformly, almost solid colored areas, the orange and the blue. And we create this outline, or the border between them, which is our architectural outline uh, in the architectural visualization context. This is super important because we always uh, want to keep the silhouette or the outline of the building uh, clearly readable. It, uh, it, in overall, contributes to a low information scene where after grasping the main idea, we immediately understand what, what, the, what the architecture is. Uh, so uh, we, we grasp the, the high level, the high level uh, pass, let's say, and then we can uh, start uh, discovering all the nice details happening and the people and uh, the action in the market here. 
And once again, the, the, the choice of color here is not um, accidental. Again, we have a complementary color palette. Uh, orange and blue are in high contrast with each other, so uh, in the purpose of this Siemens works quite well. And that brings us to the second use uh, of color, which is in the mood. Actually, color is probably the single most important attribute of an image when it comes to affecting the, new, the viewer's emotional response. There's actually an entire field of study dedicated to that. Uh, it's the psychology of color, and it basically focuses on the study of hues as a determinant of human behavior. Uh, these ideas are very important um, in uh, graphic design and marketing and branding, uh, where we want to sort of manipulate the, 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 the customer's emotional uh, response to certain products and uh, advertisements or whatever. Yeah, I will not uh, say more as an introduction. We can dive straight into the, the psychology be behind uh, it's one of the main colors. Uh, we can start with red. So yeah, depending on the shade, red can be one of the strongest and most intense colors. It indicates aggression, danger, passion, and uh, excitement. Sort of immediately and instinctively calls for, for attention. Um, yeah, maybe the, the, the reason behind this, uh, this relationship between uh, red and danger, danger is its association with uh, blood, which is red. So somehow uh, uh, we are hardwired to, to read red as, uh, as something uh, dangerous or so something that calls for our attention. Uh, next one is uh, color yellow. Again, depending on the shade, of the different shade, it's one of the strongest and more intense colors. Yeah, it's so, of course, obviously associated with, uh, with light, with sun. Yeah, yellow is a bit, it's a bit tricky. It's a difficult one, actually, to, to, to use, to extensively use in, uh, uh, in images, especially in architectural visualization images. So always try to use it strategically and in not uh, a huge extent because the, yeah, the response it will, uh, it will provoke is quite uh, intense. It's um, uh, actually interesting that uh, uh, it has been found out that uh, it's the first color that infants respond to. Um, and uh, a study suggested that uh, whenever uh, a baby was, uh, uh, was living in a space uh, uh, where the walls were, were painted yellow, in increased its uh, somehow um, anxiety and frustration. So although yellow uh, is associated with, uh, with energy and life and, and happiness, um, when used too extensively, it can also create uh, the exact opposite effect. So next one we have uh, orange. Uh, it behaves similarly to yellow. Uh, it uh, can convey the feeling of warmth, of excitement, and also it's the color of autumn with all these yellow, orange, red uh, leaves uh, and different shades of them. The same that we said about yellow applies more or less here as well. Uh, orange should not be used uh, very extensively because it's quite intense and quite powerful. And uh, actually, we can see a great uh, example of its use here in this uh, uh, painting, where we have a, a moody scene uh, in general with all these cold and, uh, uh, and bluish tones all around. And then suddenly in the middle, uh, we have these vibrant orange, strong orange, yellow tones and that's enough to convey this feeling of warmth. Again, the same that we said uh, about contrast applies here. So whenever you want to make something appear warm, then it's probably a good idea to surround it with something bluish. And uh, we can move on to color purple, which is uh, associated with mystery and imagination, but also with uh, wealth and royalty. It's uh, extensively used in, uh, anim in children's animation uh, films and uh, children's books and fairy tales. 
can see a great example here actually. This scene creates this feeling of mystery and uh, we dive into this scene and explore this imaginary world somehow. Uh, next we have color green which is obviously associated with uh, nature and thus with life but also with safety maybe exactly because uh, it's associated with nature and somehow nature um, uh, whatever is, is um, associated with nature becomes uh, friendly and healthy think of all these uh, organic products they mostly use green in their branding and packages and logos but also there are a few um, insurance companies for example that uh, make use of color green exactly to convey this feeling of safe. Next one we have a uh, color blue which is usually associated uh, with uh, sadness. Think of the uh, I have my blues phrase but also with calmness and also stability. Stability again uh, we can uh, think of many banks um, who make extensive use of blue in their branding and logos to convey this uh, this feeling of uh, of uh, safety and uh, stability. This is another example here, it's a concept art concept artwork for the Blade Runner film. Again here color blue conveys a feeling of calmness but also of mystery and uh, maybe danger because it's uh, what is happening here is not necessarily uh, positive or, or pleasant but also yeah we have these nice and clean shapes as I mentioned before uniformly clean colored shapes and of course blue is also associated with the sky and the sea and uh, so it can uh, help us convey a feeling of, of summer of vividness of, of liveliness and vibrance uh, this is a great example here and actually uh, although almost 90 percent or more of the canvas is covered with blue we still somehow get the feeling of warmth exactly because this association of color blue with, with the sky and the sea and the summer and of course these warm tones of the sunlight directly hitting this tower they help as well so yeah different associations for blue and then we have white which is uh, associated uh, with purity and cleanliness simplicity minimalism is often associated with white and the complete absence of color actually although uh, if you remember what we said in the beginning when we discussed color physics and light white in reality is the sum of every color in the color spectrum because light brings the entire spectrum the entire wavelength for every color here is a great example of a almost fully white interior and notice that almost at no Nowhere on the canvas we have an absolute pure white, maybe perhaps in the overexposed part of the skylight, but in general we have uh, mostly shades of grey and that's enough to convey the feeling of white. And last we have black which is associated with death and melancholy but also mystery and power. But these are actually uh, associations that are also culturally relevant. Uh, we share these associations in, this, in the Western world, but uh, not every culture shares them. For example, we know that the color white is the color of funerals in the Chinese culture. So that's important to, to keep in mind. We, we share these associations in our West, Western uh, context, but uh, keep in mind that there may be exceptions. Yeah, and another example of the usage of black in this uh, high-rise building here. The building is almost entirely black and then we have the strong highlights on the windows and this uh, helps us really read this vertical silhouette and everything around again it's almost purely black and that concludes the second part of the three uses of color the last one is naturalism where as we already mentioned we will uh, explore a bit the relationship between hue saturation and and uh, color and how this this uh, this group this package behaves in the in the real world in order to uh, enable enable us to uh, produce more realistically 
uh, a natural looking scene. This part will be very short. I will only go through some examples uh, or case studies well, where I will explain a few things. So I will start with this one. Here what I did was uh, desaturating a bit the, uh, the main triangle, our focal uh, triangle here. And we can immediately see that this, the result is not as realistic. It still works as a whole, it still works as an image, as a composition, everything is right. But if we want to go for photorealism, then we need to be somewhere like here. Wherever there's a direct impact of sunlight, whichever surface the, the sunlight directly hits, we would expect it to be much more intense in color, much warmer in tone and much brighter in, in value. And uh, this actually brings us back to what I was uh, saying in the beginning of the workshop uh, and uh, about the, the importance of being able to understand how light works in the real world. Because without a, a deep understanding of uh, how light bounces around different objects and how it affects color, this would not be possible for sure. And I think that's about it. So thank you all for being here.